My name's Mark, welcome back to the shop. So, uh, this is going to be part two. We're going to have quite a lot of parts of this. I've decided to... Um, well, fuck it, we'll talk about it now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a SolidWorks model of this. And um, then what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the relationships. We're going to do some... Um, kinematics so I'll explain as we go so I'll talk a bit about what kinematics are and then we'll look at the kinematics um, of this mechanism and what degrees of freedom we have which basically means how we can change it stuff like that and um, then we'll move on to some design elements so I will plot out as soon as I've got a basic model and some kinematics, which basically just means the geometry of everything. Once I've got that, we'll then go through um, some of the theoretical uh, limits, so the operational envelope. So we'll look at uh, what speeds, you know, we'll basically just plot out on some spreadsheets. I'll show you what they are um, and how each one works, and then we'll look at stuff like piston speeds, maximums, not averages, because averages are fucking useless. Um, and there, because we'll have masses, because we've got the model and we can give it certain material properties and densities, stuff like that. Then we can start looking at forces, and then because we've got forces, we can input those forces into some uh, stress analysis, and then we can see what these joints can take, and so on, and then, hopefully, design accordingly, and so on. Any road, before we do any of that, I need to go through some questions that were asked. So one of the most prominent questions that was asked about this entire thing was why? Why does it why would you want this? You know what I mean? Um, you'd want this because it is a it has the it's the best of both. Now, I know a lot of people disagree with that, but it is the best of both. You have got a four-stroke assembly, if you want to call it that, and then you have a two-stroke process to a degree. So you sort out a lot of the issues. Now, of course, there's going to be other issues, and this on its own isn't good enough, but I think that things can be tweaked at the end of the day, if we can tweak it or not, it doesn't matter. It's more about the exercise. You learn a lot about stuff if you do stuff like this. Think of this as a case study. But why would what would be the point in this is the fact that you have um, a power stroke every rev, right? And that means you have nice, smooth output compared to a, 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 four, a, a four stroke single cylinder. You know, you put four of these together, it's almost like a V8. Not for balance and stuff like that, but it, it, you know, you, yeah, and it's small and compact. Now, people say, oh, you know, there's a lot of fucking parts and stuff. Well, really, you've got a heavier rod, don't get me wrong. You've got a piston without a crown. You've got this rod in the middle, and then you've got this carrier rod here, this finger follower, basically, like a massive one, and the camshaft. You also have a camshaft with valves up at the top. Um, so it is a four stroke, and, go, and I'm going to, when, once I do the model, we can directly compare um, directly compare a four stroke model, which is made out of most of the components of this, with this, so we can see how much um, heavier it is, stuff like that. But heavier is not just the be all end all, the fact of the matter is, is that there are 1000 cc V twins, and there are thousand cc four cylinder bikes out there, and the weight, eh, you know what I mean. And there is a lot more weight in one than the other to a degree. There's ways you can steal things back, and so on and so forth. Because you get a power stroke every rev, you don't have to go as high RPM. And people, are, it's going to shake itself to bits. Well, we don't just say that, right? That's what, well, that's what people don't know what they're talking about, do. You know what I mean? And that's the whole point of this series, is not just to arbitrarily go, it's crap, don't like it. It's 
people were saying it's you know it's too complex there's too many parts to it but like i said in the video the original video there are a shitload more parts in your r1 now than there was in a, in a an air-cooled equivalent in the 70s with four cylinders there's a shitload more parts shitload more complexity um so fucking what it doesn't matter you just take the part counts of a carburetor compared to a, a fuel injector it's even with the throttle body included you know what i mean it yeah that's not an argument but um there's some of these questions that i want to get to if i can find my list because there was quite a few uh, that one so yeah, there was quite a few things that were said um, that I want to highlight. Um, like it says, can't see how it uses 20% less fuel with all the extra friction and moving mass. I don't think, so this is what we're going to investigate, this is what we're going to go through. The, the moving mass of component parts is a function of their mass. They don't weigh much, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yes, it takes energy to accelerate in one way and the other, but so does sticking, put it this way, so does sticking a pillion passenger on the back of your bike. It reduces your, you know, it reduces your acceleration and all sorts, and, you know, puts more load on the engine or what have you. But we're talking putting another person on the back of a bike. Now, yes, it's not ra rapidly accelerating, but it, it, it's what's in kind. The fact of the matter is, is most of these things are, you know, either reciprocating or they are rotating. We'll get to that. I'll get to all this. The, this then says uh, they're showing the lower piston without rings, but it needs some, or it'd slap against the ball like mad. Right, so people have got this all wrong, right? A piston ring does not keep your piston centred in your bore. There's quite a few people who said this. So if you can get your crown of a piston, and this is a massive over-exaggeration on this that you can see there, right, there's a ring groove. If you actually get your piston ring and give it a squish, right, you can actually get your piston ring to sit sub flush within your piston. You can't fucking see that red, that's gash. You can actually get your piston ring to sit sub flush in your piston ring groove. There has to be that gap clearance around the back, right? Your piston rings are not attached to the cylinder wall and the pit and the cylinder. Right? They're just not. It does not centralise the piston in the bore. This is why on pistons, I have one kicking around somewhere. I don't want to show that just yet, because it's out there. Now. So on a piston like this, this is why you get these scuffs. If you can see the scuff marks on that, this is why you get the scuffs. On this side actually there's not that much. But this is why a lot of pistons, which I've got on somewhere, I ain't got all day to look for it. But you get coatings, you know, PTFE and fucking all sorts. Um, the piston rings are not there to keep the bore centralised. And you'll get little bits of scuffing up here and so forth, right? Yeah, it's not what piston rings are for at all. But regardless. <laughs> Moving on. Um, at the end of the day it's just a four stroke engine with four strokes regardless of what bollocks oh yeah this guy pissed me off a bit at the end of the day it's just a four stroke engine with four strokes regardless of what bollocks is going on to make it go up and down I can't see it actually making any more power it, yeah if you've got that attitude this is the wrong channel for you the fucking retard network is somewhere else um you know, people who, if you're going to make a comment that it doesn't matter what bollocks is inside an engine, you're, you're wrong channel. Right, so, 
Someone says here, from a theoretical standpoint, what are the real possible ben benefits? Because the way I look at it, it's just a small piston that can't handle the detonation forces that transfer it to a real piston. Don't understand what that means. Um, yeah, and, and lots of people obviously don't understand that this is a, a two-stroke, basically. It's, you know, it takes, it, it take, it takes care of... Um, all your burning oil issues, it's got valves, you know what I mean? Some people did say stuff about valve float, we'll get to all of that. Um, the, we're going to systematically go through it. There's a, a major thing I want to talk about in a minute, let me just get through these. Um, a lot of people talk about moving parts. Um, good interesting video Matt, I thought the whole design was a bit messy, surely the cost of manufacturing will be much higher uh, and make it an unvi unviable to produce. And then I said, and a lot of people said about the Sky Active engine, this has a lot less components. Um, actually no, probably about similar, no more, because it's got the actuation motor and stuff the rest of it. Um, so obviously looking at the Sky Active engine that doesn't um isn't prohibitively expensive obviously um mm -mm, i know what that means we'll get to that one in a minute there's one other thing i want to touch on very very quickly and that's that people say uh, oh it's obsolete this is all pointless electric motors so on and so forth an electric motor is not more efficient than some of the latest engines that are out there at all um they're about mm, on par depending which cycle and which engine and so on. And it depends what you use it for is the main thing. You go city, electric, blah, 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 all that kind of shite. Um, but yes, and then people keep on talking about this 2030 thing. Now, years ago, I did the European 2040 emissions video. And in that video, I say that 2040 isn't the real year it'll get moved forward to about 2030, they'll get impatient. And lo and behold, fucking three years later, that's what happens. Um, but the fact is that we are talking, um, by 2030, it's just non-petrol only. Hybrids will still be a thing. And a hybrid is a petrol with a motor, that kind of thing. Um, so, yes, it's not what people think. It's not the death of engines completely. The death of the internal combustion engine is going to take probably 30, 40 years. Specifically with um, high torque applications, lorries, tractors, stuff like that. Electric motors aren't going to really replace that. And we're still going to be burning fuels and stuff because of uh, jets, right? So your jet airliners and stuff, they're not going to move to electric for a long time. If ever, something else will probably have to be, you know... I'm going to do a video soon about battery technology because people keep on bleating on about it like it's going to get better overnight. Well, we'll get to that. Um, and the other thing is as well is that people say in the, is in the comparison between electric and petrol, they say stuff like, um, oh, you know, well, we've got to get rid of, you know, the environmental issues. One side they say lithium production is really horrible. On the other side they say, yeah, but look at oil spills. Deepwater Horizons, shit like that for oil. But like I've said before, don't think just because petrols are going to become, not obsolete, just even if you cut the f fuel usage in half, they're still going to want the oil for all the petrol, for all the pharmaceuticals, plastics, all the fucking hydrocarbon chemistry out there. It's I don't know why people think it's going to disappear. They're idiots if they do. Um... But any road, the one thing I do want to get back on to, instead of yapping on about something else, is uh, a technical point. So, in this, I said that the intake is 120 degrees. And if you watch the video, if my head's not in the way, there we go. If we watch the video, I'll tell you what, let me zoom you in. Right then, so, we're at zero degrees, but this is the power stroke that everyone would love to say. 120 degrees there, Matt. That's the power stroke. Right, for fuck's sake. If we 
go back to just say this one, so which there's the power stroke. Right. If you look at this power stroke, right, we're about to go from TDC and we go down. Oh fucking hell! We go down to. So we unpause. Oh, I can't pause it. Let's go back. Let's go back to that thing which shows you. Right. So what we're doing here is, if you'll notice, we're at a low point on the cam, if you can see that, right over here, there, we're on a low point of the cam, right? So the lowest we can go before we come to the base circle of two things, before we get to the base circle of the cam and before this rock ram hits the crank pin on the crank, right? So the maximum, the maximum in um, stroke we can get is 120 degrees now as you can see that now what that means is it doesn't matter where in the cranks rotation this happens as in these can be tweaked what ma what I'm trying to get at is that this cam that controls the piston crown is what gives us our maximum displacement right our maximum thrust down the cylinder. Let me pull you back out a bit. So that's this is our maximum, 120 degrees. It doesn't matter where it happens. People are saying, it actually happens at 200. That's the power stroke. Yes, I get that. It's not what I'm trying to work out. What I'm trying to work out is we can see from there, because this falls, that we're not getting the full volume as compared to a normal two or four stroke. In other words, our displacement, our displacement, is usually our stroke times our bore, right? Bore times stroke, whatever. So there you see, our displacement is this, but it's not, it's not our stroke. It's 120 degrees worth of stroke. And as I said, using the R1 bore and stroke numbers, this would give you 200cc out of 250cc. Do you know what I mean? In other words, this would give you four fifths, right, of the available stroke. In other words, what I was pointing out was the fact that your stroke is not linked to your displacement anymore, right? If you look at this cam here, it's actually thin down here and fatter at this section. You could still, you could still machine that cam so you'd get 120 degrees at the other end. Now this is the thing here, you see there, right? It's 20, 200 to 65. So people are saying, Matt, I think you'll find it's 65 degrees. The degrees on this wheel is the crank. This is the crank degree. We don't give a fuck about that because obviously look what happens. If you look what happens, we're at 120 degrees there. It says it's 172 degrees there. We're definitely not 172 degrees in comparison. This is where 172 degrees would be. This, well, fucking hell, I don't know, it's probably more like 40 degrees. The fact of the matter is that's what we're trying to do is work out the displacement just to get an idea of if you had this bore and this stroke, you'd assume that it's this volume, but it's not. It's four fifths of that. So, you know, if you had, I don't know, five five cylinder two hundred cc, you're going to miss out two hundred ccs on one of those cylinders if you were just to calculate by bore and stroke. In other words, this engine is so different than the average normal engine that you used to see, even though it might look similar. Um, simple things like bore, stroke, and displacement are different. It, it doesn't mean anything. It wasn't even really a point. What I was trying to say is, you know, people saying, how does that equate to 20% less fuel? People started talking about thermodynamic, believe that, thermodynamic expansion, uh, compression and expansion, stuff like that. Well, it depends how well it burns, how what your volumetric efficiency is, and how those ratios work out. What's more important is, is that we're trying to... And 120 degrees is an approximation. If I change those numbers and make it a square engine, you know, the results would be slightly different. It wouldn't be bang on four fifths. 
it wasn't even bang on four fifths when I used the R1 numbers. It was just close enough. Um, but if we have a small enough volume, if we have a smaller volume than our stroke, that our stroke and bore would give us a calculations for, then you are going to you know, you've got twenty percent less displacement. You know how would you normally categorise this engine? You'd ask for the bore and stroke, and you'd say, oh, it's this cc, but it's not. This is almost like the Wankel argument of how exactly do you work it out, that kind of thing. This isn't, um, you know, this isn't the same as just a regular four or two stroke engine, basically. And two strokes are a bit funky when you get into compression ratios and so on and so on and so on. The other problem that you have with this is that we don't know the valve timing. We also have an extremely small duration intake. You know what I mean? If you just split this up into time, right, we go from 200 degrees to 165 for an intake. If you basically, you're saying that's, you know what, that's a fifth, right? A fifth of an entire rotation. If you're doing just, say, a thousand RPM, you got to take a fifth of that in time, a fifth of a minute, that's how much over a thousand RPM your duration is for intakes full stop. So we need to look at the dynamics of everything. This is why you, you, you know, you just can't say, oh, that's automatically this and that's automatically that. The other thing is as well is that we're not. This isn't. This is just a demonstration. I'll show you one thing. Um, I was talking about the design, not the actual that exact model, because here's a picture. Oh fucking hell! No, there isn't. Here's a picture of a diesel version, which again is completely different. We have all sorts of funky shit going on here, different kinds of arrangements where this actuation rod is actually on a saddle with a cam follower here and then a rod going up. The piston looks very, very different, a lot bulkier. I think this is the diesel version. Um, again, straight six, different configuration. Massive piston crown, so on and so forth, right? Different versions, you know, of the same idea. So when we're looking, you know, there is is what the rod should. That's again, that's a different fucking piston. This is meant to be a running example. I don't know how true that is. Um, again, the geometries of this are different. We've got a domed piston in this one. That's just a video. Why, why did I do that? I'm getting used to fucking bloody Windows 10. I hate it. Ah! Um, but yeah, there's so many different things to it that we just... It's looking at the concept, not looking at an actual design. Again, this is not an actual design. It said in all the, the bump of this supposed engine that... You know, you can install this almost like a bolting kit to any any engine design. Well, no, you can't because driving that cam or even having room for that cam for some engines that's floating outside of the block. You know what I mean? That's not something you can just install. So let's just imagine this engine's done, right? Just imagine this model is the completed engine. Let's just say we've worked out a lot of the problems and so on and so forth, and we're getting it ready to build a prototype, you know what I mean, to actually build the engine and do something with it, you know, do some testing, stuff like that. If we had this engine at the prototype stage, it is, or it would be, a brilliant design, like literally a brilliant design. This engine has the capability to be a two-stroke engine, to give the two-stroke power, yes it weighs a bit more, Yes, it's a bit more complex, that means nothing to you, as long as it runs, as long as you make it robust enough, which is about design, which I'm trying to get everyone onto the idea of. It doesn't matter how complicated something is, if it works and it's reliable. For instance, the Saturn V rocket was ridiculously complicated, like fucking stupidly complicated, but it got the men there back. It actually got quite a lot of astronauts there and back. I don't want to hear the fucking moon landing wankers. If you can make something reliable enough, you know, then it doesn't matter what the complex, the complexity, the, you know, how complicated it is, just just doesn't matter. That's not a consideration. 
this has the potential to give you more power than a four stroke um but it because it's a two stroke pretty much um but with the complexity so what your engine's a bit heavier who really gives a shit when you've got that much more power you know what i mean so let's just say that this produces 60 65 percent the power an equivalent four stroke would make per stroke but it's got two of these so then it's a hundred and thirty percent that's more power can you offset the weight and at the end of the day this is just a video series it's just a video series about a particular idea that is complicated enough to have enough topics to talk about and look at and new enough and quite trick in certain ways this can be changed in a lot of ways that's why i picked this um and there's a lot of things to talk about a lot of things to look at we can you know there's cycle changes you can make so we can look at thermodynamics we've got some stress analysis we can look at we've got packaging concerns vibration modes loads and loads and loads and loads of things and it includes a bit of everything so we've got four stroke heads crankshafts cams rocker arms weight reduction blah 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 fatigue life impact stresses torsional stresses tensile stresses <laughs> compression um contact interaction cam profiles not just the heads but also this cam profile at the bottom we've got manufacturing capability we've got assembly we've got basically fucking everything um, and then we've still got the heads so this doesn't just um, you know we're not going over the same same thing here just by talking about a four stroke engine that's out there in the world or we're not talking about a two stroke engine that's obsolete and crap this is a, a blend of a bit of everything you know what I mean yes there are things that are too heavy in it yes there's clearance issues yes there's thermal expansion issues but these are issues that we can look at and at the end of it we can say do you know what it's almost good but this and this are two fundamental things that we can't seem to get around or if we do we have to sacrifice more of this and more of that and this all rolls back into the darwin engine video that i did recently and just a lot of other videos that i've done about this kind of stuff is that shaking a stick at it and just going i don't like it because of what I, what have you um isn't good enough you know people are talking about the speeds of the piston crown but if we can make it lightweight enough and this actuation rod and this arm can take the forces you know a lot of people are saying stuff like it needs forced induction well no we've been given our parameters we've been given our design brief in a sense this guy has designed this and this is the way it has to be so we're going to tweak the design and the whole point is is as i go along through this you guys you get to stick your oar in you know do we put a cam on like a desmo torsional spring we could just put a fucking compression spring like a valve spring maybe run it off a different type of cam have it an under follower than an exterior one do what the diesel one does where it has basically this shouldered rocker whatever the best thing is is that the guy has also who basically designed this has patented it has also put patents in for variable compression in this piston crown malarkey which again is another kettle of fish just by changing the gap between these two will change your compression again it's another thing we can look at and when we get to the end of all this design stuff we're going to put this into practice that's what i'm really aiming at and it has to be something different and mental and this is quite different and mental all p all the people who said it's too many points of failure which means nothing but too many points of failure and too many places it can go wrong and too many this and too many that the sky active system is in mass production uh, it, we'll do a comparison actually one of the i'll do i'll do that in the next couple of weeks we'll just stick them side by side and we'll count pivots we'll count weight we'll count control we'll count this we'll count that manufacturing capabilities 
stuff like that, process count and all the rest of it, and just do a comparison between the two. Hey. Right, hope that makes sense. I'll see you in a bit.